The thoughts and opinions on Just Some Podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent the views of organizations that employ them or they volunteer for. They are also not responsible for spontaneous black holes or nuclear wars that may occur. You have been been warned. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another fun-filled and exciting episode of Justin Podcast. This is Tom. Hey, this is Ben. Tom, man, how's it going? Sweaty. Yeah. It is very humid in my part of Ohio right now, so... I think it's humid everywhere, but I mean... Yeah, I know, but uh, it's like disgusting humid outside right now. We just finished up the 4th of July, so do you still have all 10 fingers? Happy to report both eyes, 10 fingers, 10 toes, everybody in the family. Though, apparently, first of all, my wife is a huge fireworks fan, and she went all out this year. Some of the other places we lived had apparently much stricter fireworks regulations than wherever she went shopping for fireworks this year, because one of them went off, and I have literally been around artillery pieces before. And that it was a concussion to the chest with which she set this thing off. So uh, I was like, don't ever do that again (laughs) and make sure I'm not five yards from it when it does it next time. So uh, it was an exciting year. We'll we'll put it that way. But I'm also uh, happy and excited. We have a very special guest tonight. We have Jeff, the NP dude. Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on, and happy 4th of July. Glad you kept all your fingers. I'm not a fireworks (laughs) junkie, so I... Every time I see those things go off, I just see dollar bills burning up <laughs> in the sky. So I'm, I'm a cheap guy, so I, I, I don't tend to do that. But yeah, I'm Jeff, the NP dude. I, uh, I'm a nurse practitioner in the state of Ohio as well. I uh, am also a licensed attorney. And I started the NP Dude podcast about, I don't know, four or five years ago, four years or so ago, to help NPs understand scope of practice and some of the things that we as NPs face on a day-to-day basis. So in, in, in all candid honesty, the show has been kind of stagnant for a little bit. And it's one of the things that I, I want to talk about of getting back started into. Um, and that's something that down the line is going to happen. I've been very busy with personal stuff and, uh, you know, working and all kids and everything else, just like everybody else in life. But that's right. it's an important thing. And I think it's, it's valuable to help people. So, Yeah, I mean, that was kind of uh, why we wanted to have you on the show. We're going to actually consider this one to be one of our uh, icon series. I told you that and you're like, I'm not an icon. I'm like, but you're one of the main reasons that we got into podcasting as far as to create a nurse practitioner podcast was because of the NP dude. So, well, I appreciate you saying that. It's, you know, I, I think that it's an important thing to get out there. There's nobody in the space other than, than a handful of us. And it, it seems like when some, somebody starts, it just doesn't have enough stamina behind it. It's really got to be a labor of love to do it because there's not a lot of money in it, if any. In fact, it's a, it's a negative on yeah. my end. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so really like, not about money? money and infamy. Nobody knows who I am. You know, if they hear NP dude, they don't know who the heck I am. But in certain circles, it's it just is a lot of fun to help people. And some of the questions that came in when I was doing the show, I got 150 episodes on the podcast. And some of the questions that came in, it was great because they were they're like, I don't know, I, I've never heard of this crap before. I got to figure this out too. And so there's there's a lot of times people ask really good questions and I wouldn't necessarily know how to handle it. So I do a little research and come around with asking questions to the right people. And sometimes it's, I think, pretty good advice. And a lot of times it's just my opinion as, as an attorney and, and a, an educated individual you know, this is what I would do in that circumstance. And maybe it's not the right thing. So I beg people on a routine basis. If I'm wrong, I want you to call me out on it, you know, because I'm not, I'm not a God. I'm just a guy with a, with a phone talking to him <laughs> to himself in the car, you know? So that, and that, that's, what's kind of weird is that I, I had my phone doing this. This isn't something that I, 
you know, set out to do and just say, I'm going to grow into something. And it really did snowball. So it was a lot of fun. And, and I really anticipate getting back to it once, once life kind of, kind of gets stabilized, I guess would be the word I would, I would use. Well, I think that leads us to a good beginning part. So the beginning of each show, we like to do some social media stuff. So uh, Ben and I will do that real quick. And then if there's anything you want to talk about for social media for yourself, we'll go ahead and get to that here in a second. Well, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and oh, I messed it up, Tom. Wow. I know. It, I think it's the first time in like 80 episodes. There because, you go. It's because the NB dude's here, you know. I'm intimidated. <laughs> Sorry. You cracked <laughs> under pressure, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> There's zero pressure here, guys. Come on. I do better about this. <laughs> you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, all at Just Some Podcast. You can find us on the web. We're at www.justsomepodcast.com. You can email us, admin at justsomepodcast.com. Tom, what else can they do to help us out? Well, if they are so inclined, they can go to our website. They can scroll down to blah, blah, blah. Ready? Scroll down to just <laughs> completely different. It's because I just ate a Reese cup a few minutes ago. I still got that. You know, taste one. They can scroll down to just about the bottom of the page. You're going to see an Amazon affiliate link. Please click on that before you do any shopping, put anything in your basket. If you do so, we get some proceeds. It costs you nothing, and you can shop like we weren't even there, and we really appreciate it. Jeff? What would you like to talk about? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I just if anybody is interested in, in getting a medical legal you know, background, look into my background and, and you know, search some questions that might be unanswered in your practice, go to the NP dude. It's T-H-E-N-P-D-U-D-E dot com. And you can use the search box and find a multitude of different things in there. You know, I'd like to say I, I captured everything when I did my tags, but I do the best. And, and uh, so hopefully you can find what you need. If not, email me, Jeff at the NP dude.com and uh, ask me a question. I'll be happy to, to get back to you. I still answer questions on a daily basis for people. It's just, it doesn't end up in a podcast form. So I, I, I continually, almost every day I get people from all over the country asking questions on my drive home from work. I'm usually on the phone talking to several people just saying, Hey, don't do that. Do this. You know, these are NP colleagues talking, not legal advice, but you know, this is what I would do in your circumstance. So go to the NP dude and check it out. I am on Facebook. You can ask me questions through there. I get a lot of people going through there as well. I'm not a tweeter, so I don't do tweets. You have the automatic stuff set up, but to be honest with you, I just don't have the bandwidth to keep up with all that. So email and Facebook. And we will make sure that we get all of your contact info dropped uh, awesome. in, in the show notes so that they can uh, just click on it there to get you on Facebook or your website. So. Don't be upset that you don't have Twitter. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> I can't. Just, I mean, it would, <laughs> just saying. My my thumbs are too short. I can't type that. My 140 <laughs> characters. I'm good. I'm done. Yeah. Too many. Well, so Ben, do you want to yes, regale us with your tale this week? Sure. So, getting into a story that you may have missed, Tom. A new study has come out showing that blocking an atypical opioid receptor may help treat chronic pain. This came out from the Luxembourg Institute of Health. And they, in conjunction with scientists at the University of Bonn in Germany and the University of League in Belgium, have identified a fifth opioid receptor that apparently behaves somewhat differently. This receptor is called ACKR3, and it basically fine-tunes levels of opioids in the brain. What they found is that it actually scavenges opioids and kind of helps drag them into the cell. And so they believe that by removing uh, the molecules and preventing them from binding, basically increases pain signaling. And so what they have come up with is a molecule called LIH383 that blocks ACKR3 selectively, and it prevents it from scavenging excess opioids. And basically their findings are showing that they can potentially help treat pain and lower the pain signaling, boost the level of natural opioids in the body, and could potentially help, of course, treat chronic pain and depression. This article was published in the journal uh, Nature Communications. So that's what I have for today, Tom. Wow. Well, that I am glad that they are still trying to find things that are safer alternatives than just opiate-based medications that we can hopefully help use, especially those patients with like the chronic conditions and kind of wean them off of some of these opiate based medications like jeff you're also in ohio so i'm down a little 
farther south than you, I think, based on your shirt. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, we uh we got hit pretty hard with the opiate not that long ago, and it's I mean it's still mm-hmm. continuing, still goes on, yep, still goes on. It I mean it, it's it's more of a back burner issue at least as far as the media and everybody is concerned, but it's certainly one of those things that you know we see with daily. More so when I was in the ER than where I'm at now, but it's something that is still ever present on my mind when treating my patient. So I think, uh, I think it would be a really good alternative to have something that's like, Hey, this will help you with your pain and it's not an opiate. That would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it's really been bad. I, I did some work in South, I guess it would be East Central, right at the corner of West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Ohio. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's Appalachia down there. So there's, there's not a lot of income. There's not a lot of good jobs and there's a lot of opiates. And so it was, it was pretty bad to see that. And so I, I'm all for it. I think we got to find something better than what we're doing and we're chasing our tail with the way it's working. So yeah, you know, no, I, absolutely. I, I have patients now that, you know, that in, in primary care that, you know, and I've done a little bit of addiction medicine as well. So I, I, I kind of cross over and can kind of talk the language with, with some of the people in treatment. So they understand that I know, you know, I don't know what they're going through, but I understand what the treatment process is. And so seeing people that are still snorting fentanyl, that's, that's pretty rough. Yeah. So speaking of that, there was a famous picture, I think it was from Steubenville or East Liverpool, Ohio. Mm-hmm. It was a couple that was passed out from opiates yep. in the car with two children. Yeah. And I think I remember that. Yes. So I yeah. saw a picture and this is the part I was like, I, I will see if I can send it to you, Ben. It's a picture because there's the big debate. Should we be putting out Narcan everywhere? Obviously those two adults got Narcan that day. It's a picture of the mom now with a sign that says Narcan saved my life with her kids. Like she got clean Right. And now she has her children. So that's great. Well, yeah. And so while I understand the counter arguments sometimes for people that are like, well, if we can give Narcan to people, why can't we do insulin? Why can't we? Right. And I, and I understand both sides of the argument, or at least I feel empathetic towards both sides of the argument. But when you see that, you're like, that's why. Right, that's, exactly. That's why, that's, that's why we do it. So um, that, that happened about a quarter mile from my office. Oh, really? Really, wow. man. Yeah, you were. I used to. I, I shopped at that at that gas station every morning. I'd stop for a cup of coffee. So it's it was right there. Yeah. Wow. Well, I will make sure to try and get uh, Ben that picture, and then he can forward it to you because I found it somewhere, and I was like, I wouldn't know how to tell you to find it again if I had to. But <laughs> it was it was just one of those. I was like, it it was one of those heartwarming. Like, see that's why you do stuff <laughs> right there. That's the reason I do these things. So Jeff, if you don't mind, or would you prefer Mr. NP dude? I, I just, <laughs> no, that's fine. Fine. okay. So, <laughs> so how did you get into it? So, well, this is episode one. So not to divert people back to the podcast, but, and it's, it's a 20 minute discussion. Easy. I, I have really a weird background. I I've, Started out as a civil environmental engineer and had the intent of cleaning up the environment and a lot of altruistic, you know, I'm going to do, you know, sustainable designs and engineering and all these wonderful things for, you know, community and turned out that's not at all how most of the practice of engineering is. And so, you know, after about 13 years of that and attending law school while I was in the engineering profession, I just I got to the point where I'm like, I, I'm making one guy really rich and uh, not helping people on an individual level. And half of the projects, if not more, you do the design, you pour your heart into it, you get this project done, you sell it to the client, they, everybody's on board, and then the funding dries up, it gets shelved, and it never gets built. So, you know, you, you do a lot of those types of things where you, you invest your, your soul into it, and it turns around, and it's like, all right, well, that was a waste. You know, I got paid, we got paid, this guy got rich, but Nobody's going to see what I ever did. And so some of that was, was um, just not as fulfilling as I had hoped it would be. And so, you know, I spent years thinking, what, what would I do if, with my engineering and law background? What could I go do? And it was kind of like looking at a target. And I started with the center, center circle, I, you know, with this, with my engineering background, with my legal background, I could do this scope of, of practice, so to speak, so this type of work. And then it, that, none of that sounded great. So I went to the next bigger circle. Okay, what else could I do? And, you know, what, what else could I do? And eventually it turned into uh, there's nothing with what I got right now 
that really entices me to stay where, where I am. And so I soul searched. It was years, years of doing that. And I looked at everything from auto mechanics to building motorcycles to being a farmer to everything. And my wife said one night, we're sitting down and I'm Googling jobs for the one millionth time. You know, what can I do with my life? And she goes, just, you're a nurse. And I said, you're so full. Of, you're, you're full of it. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, I'm like, wiping butts and people sneezing on you. You can do that stuff. And so that's really what started it. She's a physical therapist. And, and most of the people in my family, my brother's an orthopedic surgeon. My other brother's a, a podiatric surgeon. My mom's a nurse. I have multiple physical therapists in the family. And, you know, I'm this wacky engineer. <laughs> And, you know, everybody loves what they do or likes what they do. And I hate my job, you know, and so that's kind of what kicked it off. And I, I shadowed some people, I was trying to be smart about it. So I shadowed CRNAs, I shadowed NPs, I shadowed bedside nurses. And it was like a high school kid starting all over again. What do I want to do with my life? And so I, I went that route and did an accelerated BSN program and uh, haven't looked back. So you didn't start off with a specific nursing goal in mind. You just kind of like, this is the field. I'll figure it out from there. No. So that's a good point. I started out thinking CRNA, you know, like a lot of guys going into nursing, it's kind of, you know, uh, you know especially with an engineering background, it, it seemed to make sense. And I went right into my BSN thinking, I'm going to do CRNA for sure. Absolutely. And I'm, 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 I have contacts there already. I'm already p- paving the way, even in undergrad nursing. And before I even went into the nursing program. I talked to the director of the CRNA program. Everything was, you know, the guy liked me. He was like, he called me right back. I got to talk to this weird guy that wants to go to nursing with your background. And so, you know, I, I had some opportunity there. And then I went and worked in the ICU to get my experience in the ICU. And I hated shift work. <laughs> I hated working night shift. And I'm like, I can't work in a hospital the rest of my life. This isn't going to work. And, and, but and that was part of it. But the other part was I saw how CRNAs and this isn't a bash on CRNAs that we, we need them. They're great. I love them. But they, they don't get the personal interaction that you get when you're in family practice or in yeah. primary care. You, you knock them out. You ask them if they got dentures. You knock them out. You wake them up and you and you push them into an ICU bed or wherever they go. OK, I post the post op. So for me, that that was not going to work for my personality. It would have worked for a, a while, just like engineering did. You know, it was, it was interesting, but that eventually wears off. So I, I realized in the ICU that I had a knack for telling people about their illnesses and educating families. You know, they're just scared. And you know, I would get report from the day shift and they would say, you know, this family's a, a disaster. They're a pain in the ass. And they, all they do is do, they're just always just there and bugging me. And, you know, I, I would tell people, don't tell me about what the family is. Tell me about the patient and let me form my own opinion. Those were the best families because all they were was scared. They just yeah. were scared. And so, you know, you take the time to educate them and then they loved you and they would let you do your job and, and they would help. And so that, philosophy of education really stuck with me. And I had applied for FNP school before I even thought about going and doing my interview with the CRNA. And it's like, I turned it down. I'm like, I'm not going to interview with you guys. I found my, my calling. I'm going to do this. So I think I've, I've had a blast. I, when I first got into nursing, I wasn't exactly sure, but then as the nursing school process went through and I got, I actually, for my surgery, they stuck me with the CRNA. I have no clue why it just, Oh, go with this dude. So I walked around this guy and I thought the same thing, like, Oh, this is it. I'm going to be a CRNA. (laughs) This is what I want to do. And I went to ICU and I did everything. And I was like, "Mm, nah, I mean, there was a few other obstacles for me as well. Like geographically where I was trying to find a CRNA school and doing a couple of things became a hurdle, which I could have cleared, but it became do I want to go FNP or do I want to go CRNA? And FNP was, it was a much brighter star that I wanted to go to. And also, and again, same as you, I have several CRNA friends. I love them to death. I think they're great. And I'm envious of how much they get paid. But at the same time, like you said, they're kind of pigeonholed. Like that's what they do. And I have a much broader horizon to play with. Right. So I prefer. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is that even depending on the state, some of the restrictions are worse for those guys. Yeah. Um, you know, so think it's easier and, and I'm an autonomous person. So when I was interviewing for NP jobs, I, you know, I, I interviewed for, for positions where they wanted what I call an RN plus position. An RN plus to me is, is an RN that got their master's 
really doesn't want to have independent practice, really doesn't want to diagnose and treat. They just, they want to fill scripts, do refills and do, you know, that in-between zone between being an, an RN and being an NP. And some people are fine with that. I'm not that person. I'm, I'm an autonomous person. So when I was doing specialty interviews, I knew going into a specialty that I was going to be a quote mid-level. Uh, that's where I was going to be. And yeah. in family practice, you know, I'm, I'm not mid, there's nothing mid-level about me in family practice. You know, I keep up with the physicians in the office and I, I do just as good a care and my outcomes are sometimes better and sometimes theirs are and we, you know, we all do a good job. So that for me would have been a difficult task to be that, that intermediate in between. Ben, did you ever feel like you had something else in mind? Not really. Of course, I started out in the ER as a nurse and I liked ER and one of the ER physicians I worked with kept trying to convince me to go to medical school. And I just got to the point where I was like, you know, I don't want to go to the medical school route, but there's something more for me than just being a nurse. Uh, and that's not a, a, a dig on any nurse by any means. I just felt like there was something more for me. And it was like, always, I was always going to just go the F&P route. Yeah. I mean, I did ER after I did ICU. So, I mean, I had that mix, but yeah, I did pretty much the same thing. I got into an ICU and I was like, I'm doing this, get my year or two, go to CRA school. Like I had this whole plan and now. Yeah. No, that didn't, that, that's not what happened. Well, I, I went, when I was in the ICU, I was taking the prerequisite, which were the, the classes that were the CRNA classes that you could take being accepted to the master's program, but not into the CRNA program. So I was taking the, the CRNA pathophysiologies and the stats class, all that stuff. I was getting it out of the way. So that way, when I was in CRNA school and in my mind thought there was, if I can bang that out and get the easier stuff that, you know, is just going to bog me down, I can focus truly on the clinical stuff and, and the more the more therapeutic stuff when I'm in the program. So when I went to my FNP program, I had just had a year of pathophysiology that was more in depth than what I had <laughs> in my FNP program. And so, you know, I, I didn't have to kill myself, which was nice. It was a lot of repeat. So, it was, you know, I, I paid for an extra year of classes. I don't think I've had you know, I can't, I, I quit adding up numbers of years of college. But I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember, but, but I, I, I even went above and beyond to do that. So, so how, so you, you have your legal background, uh, obviously you're a nurse practitioner. So how did you decide to start melding the two into a podcast? I mean, was it, you were starting to <laughs> answering quick people's questions initially, like, outside of that and it just turned into that or, or how did you so, yeah it just kind of it just kind of happened I, when I was I was sitting in class it was like my last semester in my MP program and I'm a podcast junkie I listen to Rogan I listen to a whole bunch of different podcasts and so I'm sitting there looking for a podcast for NPs and there was a couple like that flirted with it for a hot minute and then they were gone and so and they weren't very entertaining I you know I like podcasts like this where you just chat with people I, I can't stand the pre-recorded you know just it's read yeah. off of a script I, I'm completely non-script oriented so there was nothing fun to listen to in, in our in our sphere so I was joking around with with some of my classmates I'm like I'm gonna start a podcast I can't find one and and they're like well, what are you gonna call it I said I don't know I say dude a lot and I'll call it the NP dude <laughs> so that's where it came from. It was just a bunch of, of me and my classmates joking around. And what happened was the, you know, I, when, when I was in my classes, the APRN role classes, I just sat there quietly and listened to the instructors get it wrong. And it, and it was frustrating because they didn't know, the, you know, any of the malpractice issues. They didn't know anything about malpractice. They didn't understand anything about contracts. Scope of practice was like, they don't get it. You know, they probably aren't going to get themselves in trouble, but there shouldn't be teaching this stuff. So I would research this stuff and I would look at the stuff that they were teaching and I would bring my spin on it. And I've been recording my notes and lectures for my other classmates since undergrad nursing school. So I have hours and hours of me droning on about every class from pathophysiology to pharmacology assessment, all of them. I've got audio files, all this stuff. So I started doing it for my classmates. I was just, I'm going to make a podcast. I was just going to make a, put a website up and I was going to make it. And if, you know, the 30 people I went to school with used it just for their benefit. Great. And it, and I put it linked at the Facebook and next thing you know, I had, you know, 3000 people 
<laughs> watching on a day-to-day -day basis. So it was pretty, it was pretty fun to see it snowball, but it just kind of was very organic. It wasn't pressured at all. I didn't jam it down people's throat. I, you know, at the beginning when somebody would say something in one of the Facebook groups, I, you know, and they're, you know, hey, I don't understand malpractice. Can somebody explain it? I just would, I would go in the sub thread. I, I didn't like going to the main thing and posting because I think that's, you know, a little cheesy from my perspective. But I'll, I'll tag a, a show that I did and say, hey, I talked about this here. Go, t go have a listen. And so, uh, you know, that, that was really my advertisement. It wasn't really me going out and doing a lot of trying to, snipe in on conversations all the time. It was really just trying to be on the slide. Hey, if you have a question, PM me, that type of stuff. But with your background, there weren't times you were like, I'm going to light this dude up. <laughs> like there wasn't, there wasn't a few times. Cause I, yeah. I read Facebook now and I'm like, Oh, like there are times it just, it just makes my head hurt. So no, no I, I'm not going to lie. I hate social media. <laughs> if, if it wasn't for my legal practice and helping people, I wouldn't be on there at all. It's just, it's, it's a time sink. I got too much crap to do to sit in there and argue about simple things that I'm not going to convince people. And I, I've had to teach myself. I, I can't tell you how many times I've typed out a response to somebody and then deleted it because I don't want to get sucked into the five comments back and forth and back and forth. And my brother-in-law is a lawyer and he told me, I'm not doing that crap. I don't have time for it. And, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, as, as a guy getting in there and, and with some authority in a, on a topic, it, it comes off wrong. And so I've been accused of mansplaining and everything. Else, and I'm oh. like, all right, fine. I'm, you know, I, I'm not here for that. I'm trying to help, you know. Mm -hmm. so, but, yeah, I, I, I see something wrong. It's like, oh, that's not good advice. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, you got to put the stop sign up like, hey, <laughs> yeah, I well, wouldn't do that. Yeah, well, the one, the one that comes to mind is when, when somebody, you know, when you, when you get credentialed with an insurance company, your contract typically will say something like this. Any proceeds that are paid directly to the employee shall be assigned over to the company because it's theirs. It's not your money, right? Well, somebody was saying, hey, I got a check from Aetna or United Healthcare. One of, I don't know who it was, but one of the insurance companies cut him a check for like 800 bucks and they went on a shopping spree. I'm like, well, you can't steal that money. <laughs> you can't, you're going to lose your job. You got to pay that back. So, you know, it's those types of things where, where people just don't understand the process of how we, we get to where we're supposed to be and stay safe. I just, I talk to people on a day to, day to, daily basis where they're getting themselves in the, in the shady situations. And I think that was kind of some of the appeal of your show was for me personally, in my nurse practitioner program, I, we got a 45 minute lecture on, on contracts and contract negotiations. And they brought us in one type of contract from the person who was talking. And that was literally the extent of what we did. And, you know, there was no business side of things. There was no, how do right. you chart this as a two, one, three versus a two, one, four. I mean, there was none yeah. of the, the business side of things. It was just, okay, you're a nurse practitioner now. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. You're yeah figure it out. And you're, you know, you're, you're actually very lucky that you even got 45 minutes to be honest with you. M most of them don't know. And it's not because they don't want to teach it. They just don't have the resources to understand it or know it. And, and I've offered, I've done lectures for local universities. I was signed up for this one and then COVID happened. All right. I'm yeah. not going to say who it is. Okay. Yeah, it's on my shirt yeah, right now. Yeah. That's where I did my engineering degree. And I was supposed to go and I think it was May and do a, you know, speak on contracts and negotiations. I've done them for the state chapters of OAAPN. I, you know, so there it's, there's information. There's people like me willing to do it, but you know, I, and I ask these program directors, Hey, come on, I'll, I'll come in. I'll just chat for an hour with your class and try to keep them safe. And there's not, there's not been a lot of, of reception to that, which I, I find is it's disheartening. Odd. Yeah, that It's means, disheartening. I mean, you know, I really would have hoped that they would have been more, you know, oh, geez, we got a guy here that has both worlds in one. Um, there's only a handful of us in the, in the state and then and only a couple more than that, and probably the country. Um, you might want to lean on that. Yeah, so, you, would, you would think that they would be beating down your door to get you to come in and talk to students just because oh, of your experience. This one did. <laughs> okay, so I'm, going, I'm showing them a picture of my shirt, by the way, guys, in case you want to know what, what I'm doing. Um, but, but those guys did. And, and, and it's because I have a friend in that program right now. So they, and there was a connection there, but you know, I cold call people. They're like uh, the NP dude, that's cheesy, you know, and it's a, it's a hokey name and it's supposed to be kind of self-deprecating because I didn't want to take myself serious. 
You know, if, if you take yourself too serious, then everybody's going to make a joke of you. So, you know, th this is this is for fun, and hopefully, some people get some get some information out of it too. Any professors out there? I don't care if we do a Skype. I'll go through contracts with with classes all over the country. I'll teach people anywhere. I don't care. Well, and honestly, that was one of our first episodes, and we had discussed that, and that was all of this is part of that nucleus of what got us into this was. We don't know, and not that either of us is a, a lawyer by any main, but it was the same thing. Like, I'm a new NP, so I'm like, Ben, what what should I know? He's got some experience doing research. We kind of put it all together. We're like, hey, I bet other NPs or people going through this, they don't know either. Right. So why don't we kind of push this? And then that's also kind of how we stumbled down your road, and then we found the NP dude. And again, I liked the format. I was like, is this like a 20-minute episode? I did not realize for the longest time in my head that you were doing this while recording like on your phone. I'm like, man, this guy is always on the move. He has to record the episode <laughs> on his phone. I do it. Hey, I, Lord. I pull, I had an hour and 15 minute drive. So that's why that's Ooh. part of the reason the show isn't there now is because I don't have that, that alone time. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I could sit there on the, on the road and think of, you know, something, what do I want to do a show? And, and sometimes I just turn the go button on and just start talking. Yeah. So you know, I apologize for those episodes, guys. <laughs> oh no, they were, they were good episodes. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Oh uh, no, no. That I, there are well, and anytime you do, and and again, I I think we agree with you on the main philosophy is we want a conversation. We don't want something boring. We want something that's engaging for the listener and for the people that are talking. And, and sometimes you don't know where it's going to go. You just have right. to start. You just have to hit record. And uh, hope it turns out well. It and now, that's, now yeah. because sometimes, sometimes you're just in the moment, and you just talk. And so I, there's times where people say, "Well, I don't agree with what you said in episode 37." I don't know what I said in episode 30. I gotta go <laughs> re-listen to it. I have no idea what I said. I, I contradict myself all over the place. I don't think I do, but maybe I, you know. And some of it too is you can see a progression. You know, as you as you get educated on a topic, and the more you think about it, the more you research it, and the more you learn about it. You, you tend to, your views are going to change the way you say it's going to change the way you, you know, you might be more passionate without the knowledge at the beginning. And then you start saying, well, maybe it's not, not as clear as that. So, you know, that, that I think happens with everybody. So, but I've never edited. I just go, what do you get is what you get. You know, if you don't like it, you can, you can tell me I suck and then move on. I don't <laughs> care. Right? How many one star reviews have you got? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't. I haven't looked in a long time. I'm guessing there's a bunch. I don't know. I it was it was doing okay there for a while. I had a couple people that you know said, "Oh, he's too new. He doesn't know what he's talking about with respect to scope and stuff like that." Well, some of it was you know I was brand new NP when I started that podcast, so I was mm -hmm. kind of doing a day in the life of a new NP. This is the issue I came against today, and I didn't you know I never thought I'd have to deal with that, and now I have to deal with it. And here's how I do it. And so, you know, and, and part of it was trying to get a dialogue from people that maybe they had a better way of doing it to get some information. I've, I've had people call up or, or text me or email me or, and find me through Facebook and say, you know, I, I don't agree with how you did that. I would have done it this way. And I, yeah, that's fantastic. But it's not very often. Most of the time, I've never had anybody tell me I suck. I keep asking people, tell me I, I suck. Tell me. They don't tell me. At the beginning of our show, you kind of alluded to the fact that you've kind of been on a hiatus for some personal stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I know in us talking privately, they might be bringing the show back here before. No, it so it, in, in all candidness, I'm an open book. I mean, it's just, I don't want people trolling my personal life and, and I'm not famous. So nobody does. I mean, if somebody <laughs> told me, I'd probably be like, Oh, awesome. Come on in. You know, and, <laughs> Come back, come have a drink with me. You know, if I had a stalker, I'd probably be my new best friend. You know, but um, see so, Ben. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Nobody cares that much, right? In in the last two years, I designed my own house, and I've been building my own house for the last year, year and a half now, almost a year. It's just over a year. You know, every every night and almost every weekend, I'm swinging hammers and putting pipes in and digging my basement and doing all that stuff. So I'm I'm extremely overwhelmed 
doing that. Something I've, I've done it before building the house I'm in now, but I, that was 20 years ago. And, you know, I didn't have kids and I didn't have, you know, a podcast and, and a, a full-time NP job and then a legal practice, you know, throw all this stuff together. It, it starts to get a little time consuming and something had to give. So that, that was the first thing. And so I'm hoping to be in by the end of the year at the house. And then, you know, I got some cleanup work at this house and then for sale. And then after that, it's, you know, life is going to be, you know, somewhat sane again. So that's that's a, the selfish reason why I'm not doing the podcast, guys. So I apologize. <laughs> so, so you're also an architect on top of. Every, well, <laughs> I'm a civil engineer, right? So I, I you know, it's kind of in the same sphere. Well, I mean, this was good, you know, because I had talked to Jeff six months ago or so, and you know, he had said that he was building this house. I'm like, oh, we're wanting to build a house too, and then I realized. No, he means he's no, he physically, was building. Yeah, like he's physically building his house. I'm like, oh, no, no. Building not. that, <laughs> yeah, Ben. Yeah, good yeah, stuff. He, yeah, he's got the claw hammer in his hands, bro. <laughs> yeah, so. think, you'd be surprised at the times I've smacked my thumb. <laughs> I got bruises all over, man. It's sore. But uh, <laughs> and it was funny. I think, Ben, you commented to me on uh, where you been. And I put out a podcast and I said, dude, I bought a backhoe. I was just joking, but I just literally bought a backhoe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was digging my, digging my foundation. But oh, yeah, that's, that's the reason, guys. And it's not it's it's a selfish one. And, it, and I, I do struggle with that because I do want to help people. So I do answer questions. I can't give true legal advice outside of the state of Ohio. So I do talk hypotheticals with people and it's educational. So I think that there's a, a fine line, but a definable one for people across the country. And sometimes I'll get a long, giant, just a j drama email that is just horribly long. I, I just, my response is just call me. It's easier just to call me. I could talk on the phone while I'm driving. I can't read this crap for 10 minutes. I don't, have the, I don't have the time. So a lot of people across the country are like, I just emailed them and five minutes later, they call me and, and I don't have a problem with that. You know, just don't call me every five minutes. I got to get stuff done. <laughs> down the house. For God's sake. <laughs> so moving away from the podcast briefly, uh, uh -huh. how did you get from podcasting to, and I know you kind of helped form a national organization and then that has kind of went away yeah. for the time being but i mean so how did you get from where you were to now let's try to make a even bigger impact yeah so chris woods did a podcast the, the mp money show for a hot minute and, until he got busy with life as well and he reached out to me or i reached i can't remember we we connected somehow a couple of years ago and just became instant friends. Just like we, you know, we, we never met each other in person, but we talked on the phone you know, all the time and we Skyped and just bullshit all the time. And, and if, are we allowed to swear? Uh, of course. Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that, that's who I am. I can't help it. I, it's, it just comes out. So no, you're good. That, that's how right. Tom is too. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So, um, you know, we, Chris and I just hit it off and just one day we're on Facebook and we were seeing the, the lack of just, common sense that's happening coming from new grads in in NP and John Canyon who's a, a very vocal voice on all of the forums and is a leader in our industry whether it's recognized through formal channels or not that that man's a leader and he's a fantastic fantastic human being he just PM to me and we started talking and we hit it off and then the next thing you know me Chris and John were on and we recorded it and Chris and I both published it to our podcasts and things just exploded. So what we were concerned about is the lack or the lack of oversight in the decreasing quality of education for nurse practitioners. And this is a taboo topic. So we have to be careful. You know, if you want full practice, you can't say these things out loud, right? I mean, we're giving ammunition to the other side, quote unquote, although I don't think there's a side on this. I think it's just, you know, we, we, we are our own worst enemies here. And so it, it kind of spurred the Clinical NPs for Change Facebook group. That night after that, that recording, I, I started the Facebook page and Chris and John were all admins for that group. And we, we just kind of went with it just saying, okay, guys, what, what do we want to do if we, had a, if we could reinvent the wheel and, and make it better than what we got now, what would we do to do that? And so it was a lot of information gathering, a lot of frustrated people at first saying, 
when's somebody going to do something, do something, do something? Well, it, it, we got to find out what the problem is before we can do it. So it was really frustrating. There's a lot of people were getting angry with us. So you guys don't do anything. You're all talk. You're all talk. Well, okay, let's do it. We, we're forming a national organization, but we couldn't just jump right into that. We had to formalize it. We had to get the LLCs. We had to get the accounting set up. We had to come up with what our website was going to look like, all the stuff that's going to make this a legitimate organization. So it's kind of like Prince where he lost his name, right? He became a symbol. Right. So the, the, the uh, artist formerly known as, and I'm not going to say the name because we were threatened with a lawsuit from ANP. So I, I was on vacation, came back home, saw a certified letter taped to my front door. Not that it makes my you know butthole pucker too much, but usually I don't get those. As a lawyer, every now and then I'll get one. So I'm like, oh, crap, AAMP is a little angry. So I picked up the letter, and it was a cease and desist. It was completely foundless. It was baseless, but they got the pockets to fight us and put us under. So yeah. we debated, are we going to fight this? The moral principle of us fighting it was, you know, this – we're not utilizing a name that was so confusing that, that it would have been a, a violation of, of trademark or, or trade name. So, you know, but that, you know, what are you going to do? You, you know, again, we don't have deep pockets. We're just starting out. So that, that's what, what happened to the, the organization. Now we had had some good, some good feedback in a very short period of time where we had published some, some information about the CCNE. And then, I don't know if, if the listeners, do we want to get into CCNE stuff or is that, do you guys want to talk about that? Let's go wherever we go. Yeah. Right, I mean, well, so we've been very vocal this. about uh, yeah. education yeah. issues. So yeah. Yeah. We've done episodes uh, on the same thing. So who are you guys certified with? Let's get that out of the table. <laughs> well, I'm certified through A and P. All right. Well, me and you might lose our shirts. All right. Cause there's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Not Tommy. So. <laughs> like, ASCC is like, go boy. <laughs> yeah, ASCC, you. All right. No, I'm, I'm just joking. I love AAMP. I love you guys. Don't sue me. All right. Me either. <laughs> don't, don't sue me either. Ben's a nice guy. He's, he's <laughs> so the, the issue with, with our educational process, the oversight for the quality of our programs is done mostly, not completely, but most of them are CCNE certified. Okay, so the, the academics have to be certified as an institution. It just so happens that the CCNE is a subsidiary of the AACN. Okay, and I don't remember what the acronym stands for. It's been two years since I looked it up. But basically, the AACN is all of the deans of all the universities. So it's the fox, yeah, yeah. So it's fox in the hen house, right? So, so we have all the deans of the universities with the educators that own an organization that certifies themselves. So it's not in their best interests to find us preceptors. It's not in their best interest to require difficult standards for entry, because if they did that, then they would lose revenue. Yeah. Okay. Now, AANP and ANCC have a little bit of, a, of an issue here as well, because guess what? The more people they pump out through these institutions, ANP's response has been in our CCNE group as well as others is that we have no way to moderate education. We don't have anything to do with that. But if you look at all of the fellows for AANP, almost all of them are educators. Okay, so again, we have the same groups of people. Now, it's not the same people. I'm not a conspiracy wacko. But we have educators. Academia is in charge of the watching academia. And the people that are getting the certifications for the NPs are academics. And then on top of that, let's layer in the fact that, that AANP says we don't have anything to do with any of this education, but they get benefit of more certifications being sold, okay, yeah. when the kids graduate. I say kids because I'm old, right? So when <laughs> graduate they, they got to go take a test that's a lot of money and then every five years they get a lot more money right so it's in their best interest to have more people and more revenue coming in now they they use the the philosophy of well geez if we have two hundred and fifty thousand NPs paying us a bunch of money every year then we can use that to get you full practice but at what expense so I, I encourage people on the individual level to kick ass do a good job and prove that you are worth every penny you get and then some because we can't rely on our profession to do it for us. Yeah. <laughs> I right? mean, I, I, it's, and I'm passionate about it because I've, I've, I've read so many of their white papers that are written like they're by a five-year-old. You know, go to the AAC. I encourage all of you, go to AACN's website 
It'll link you to CCNE. I mean, it's not even like a separate thing. It's like on their website. And then go through their white papers and read them and, and just read them. And you'll find out they don't make a lot of sense. So the one thing we did do in our small group of, at the time it was around 1,000 members in the Facebook group, we had about 400, 450 emails because we had people email us as well so we could keep track of the emails so they, they, we would know how many they got. And we proposed changes to the CCNE's guidelines for the quality review of the educational institutions in which, they, in which they actually reviewed. And they did make some changes, so it was positive. But we're hearing now, to this day, of all the complaints that have been made by students that they weren't getting preceptors provided to them, you know, it's fallen on deaf ears. So, you know, even if they change the, the rules, nobody's enforcing them. So it's really sad. It, it is sad. And as a, I still consider myself a newer nurse practitioner. When people talk to me and they're like, well, this is what I've been thinking about. I am almost to the point where I'm like, you really need to consider what you're going to get into if you start to head down this path because of some of the issues at the educational level coming up. And it's disheartening because I love what I do and I love working with people, but we have got some major hiccups. I'm trying right. to think of good ways to put some of this stuff. We have, we have got some things that we really need to deal with. And as you said, when the Fox is in charge of security for the hen house, perhaps it doesn't always get, that's not the first priority and yeah. perhaps it should be. And, and I, I mean, I guess that's maybe the best way I can put it, well, but no, I, I think it's something Ben and I have also, been on about multiple times ourselves so yeah it's t tough because in the nursing profession and i hate that the the old adage that we eat our young but that's what it sounds like so you get people that have been a nurse for 20 years that going back finally have been you know raised their kids and they're in a position in their life where they can follow their passion and then they're, they hear things like this where you know we're poo-pooing on the education and don't get me wrong I, there are excellent excellent NP programs out yeah, there. Absolutely. It's just that the enforcement allows the lowest common denominator to get lower. That's the problem. And so, yeah. you know, the, if people really, if, if directors of NP programs really wanted to improve their quality, if they did so, they could charge more money, add another year, and people would gladly pay it because it's not about a lack of people willing to pay for the education. Some are. I don't want to work with them. If it's I'm at the cheapest yeah. place I can go to as fast as possible, yeah. I don't want that. I paid more so I could go to the best program I could get my hands on because I wanted to do better. And, and I implore people to be yeah. that way. Now, whether they will, you, we got a lot of nurses out there. You're going to get a, a hodgepodge of all of it. But I think that we, we just have to do better we, as, a, as a profession. We got we to gotta figure out a way to fix this. I think well, that's what Tom and I have come out numerous times and it's like there should be some sort of standard to get into in P school. You should not be able to just statements that I've used before is you know you shouldn't be able to be 18, go to a four year BSN program, graduate at 22 with your BSN and then just immediately start nurse practitioner school without ever having worked as a nurse. Right. You know, now, now that's that's one of the things that my views changed over time. When I started out I I would not have needed to go personally and work bedside for an extended period of time to understand the concepts of being a bedside nurse. Okay. What I went, what I recommend, and, and my view has changed on that over time. I, I do think that's beneficial because you need to learn to be at the bedside with somebody for 12 hours that's suffering for you to become a nurse. That it's just part of that process. Physicians don't get that. So it is a different mindset. The the thing for me, I think, is a bigger point about that that entry bar as far as experiences to make sure you really want to do it. You might passionately love bedside, but if you jump from, you know, getting a, a, an, an RN, uh, BSN, jumping right into NP school, you would have missed out on the opportunity to find a career path that might have been much more beneficial for you. And maybe you wouldn't have burnt out or you would have liked it better. So I, I think that that cooling off period is beneficial and allowing the, the nurse to be the nurse first. So that's, that viewpoint's changed. So I admit that. Well, and one of the things, and because Ben and I have actually had that discussion, well, this person 
probably could. And obviously you're one of those people. I'm like, he probably could have just walked through it and it would have been a big deal. My argument for the standardization is just that, that it becomes a uniform standard. You're right. There are the one in a hundred that can walk through it with no problem. And I've, and it sucks for them. I don't know how else to put it, but I need the other 99 to be at that level as well. And right now we have a very scattered approach to how we're gathering these people. So we have a non unified product putting through a disjointed process and we're expecting the same result on the out on the other side. I'm like, that is not going to happen. And I just think as a profession, my other biggest concern is not just for the patients, but for us, like, if we continue to put out a product that maybe is not the best, what happens to us? Yeah, no, I I think that's already happening to some degree. It's just, uh, you know, but if you look at the studies that, that show why they're pumping out the number of NPs and how they justify it, it was the 2011 IOM report that said that we were going to have such a drastic shortage in uh, primary care providers and healthcare providers that uh, there will need to be a drastic in- increase in the number of NP programs and NP students. And they've taken that all, you know, that's 2011. We, if, if I was in NP school, I wouldn't be able to use that report because it's, less than, it's more than five years old, right? So, yeah. but still to this day, we're parroting that that is the, the gold standard of why these programs are turning a blind eye and just dumping out. Is, and it's not a brick and mortar versus online thing. No, no, not at all. It never yeah. was. So I, I, I hear people say, well, you're always, you, you know, people on the CNPC group are always just anti-online program. And it, th- that's not the point. The point is the volume of people that are getting dumped out. When you have brick and mortar, good, bad, or indifferent, you only have 30 seats. So you can't pump out 700 people per, per semester. Yeah. So, so that, that's the problem. It's not the quality necessarily of the online program. It's the ability for them to dump out so many people. One, and without the ability to find preceptors for them is disingenuous. To me, that's fraud. You're, you're taking their money with the intent that you're going to have a spot for them to graduate and go on with their future career. And they can't get anywhere past their first year because they can't get any, any clinical sites set up. So yeah, to me, I, that, that's plain fraud. I had to do some pretty drastic measures <laughs> to get through uh, through my NP program, and will, yeah. luckily I was in a position I could do them as drastic as they were. But yeah, I, again, it goes back to the the process of you're absolutely right. These guys are taking, I should say, the process you are identifying is right. These guys are taking this money and basically telling the students like, hey, you're going to have this great life as a nurse practitioner. Oh, by the way, you're not going to be one for the next six years because that's how long it's going to take you to get an uh, well, preceptor. And, and, and then so. by the time they get a preceptor set up, they have to retake the first year of classes because they're no longer valid. Yeah. You know, and, and, or you have to transfer to somewhere else where you can get preceptors and, oh, they don't accept your, your previous classwork because they don't trust it. So yeah. you have to pay somebody again. So, I mean, and, and that's, that to me is just blatantly disingenuous. I was shocked. I had no idea that preceptors weren't provided when I started my MP program. I was, I was baffled when that, that was like the, the second week in my class. I'm like, wait, 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 you seriously, I have to go beg somebody and hope it's okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you mean, you don't have a, a review of who's teaching me in the clinical setting. Uh, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't <laughs> seem right. Now, luckily I have good preceptors and I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to, you know, get into it, you know, so that, that saved me, I think. But, you know, so from that perspective, I was very lucky, but I know people that sat in the corner, they didn't, mm. weren't allowed to really touch patients that much. Really. Think about what other profession requires you to find your own preceptor. I mean, think, you know, you like welding, you don't see them like, well, you know, I can go with this top welding guy or I can go find Joe down the street and, Ask him, and he, I'm sure he'll be fine with it. I mean, it's right. it is an odd conundrum <laughs> that we have put ourselves in. But it, but if you put yourself in the institution, the educational uh, institutions seats, there's no physical way for them to be able to do what they're pump out the number of students. So in their eyes, there's not a problem. Mm-hmm. They just ignore it. It's not our responsibility. It never has been, so it's not a problem. Well, it's going to be a problem eventually, so they can either deal with it now or they can deal with it later, but eventually yeah, it's, it's going to fall on their lap. 
So. Well, the problem is, is that we're getting over. And, and, and Tom, what's your where, and I don't know where what part of the state of Ohio are you in? Where are you? Columbus, basically. OK, so you're you're Columbus. And, and I review contracts all over the state of Ohio. So I, I could tell you right now, the salaries in the last three years have dropped significantly. Yep. Because of oversaturation. And, and I'm not talking just in the city of Columbus or Cleveland or Sandusky or wherever. I, I get them all from all over the state. I get them in rural. I get them everywhere. And to be honest with you, I'm seeing psych NPs that used to make 20, 30 grand more than FNPs make them what brand new FNPs make with a couple years experience. That's yeah. And, and that's a drastic drop. That is a drastic drop. And that's also the conversation I've had with other MPs. That's one of the things I said. I said, hey, you know, not that this should all be about money, but let's talk about the money for a second. And when you oversaturate to the degree that we are and are continuing, this is going to be the end result. So all these people are like, oh, come be an MP. It's going to be great. I'm like, you do realize that when they're out and if that new MP is willing to do your job you know, for 20, 20 grand less, eventually they're going to go for that, that person. Oh, and, I, I, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, but no, but you're, okay. the, even the, the, the administrators in the hospitals are hopeful for that. Yeah. They're, they're bean counters. They, 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 as long as you're not getting sued, they don't care yeah. if the patient's outcomes are fantastic or not. They, they don't know. They don't understand that. They see dollars. Yeah. So, they want X plus Y. They see an, an NP is an NP. You're a nurse with an advanced degree, and that's what you are. Yes. And we can get you cheap. Yeah. And, and I, I think I, I think there may be isolated cases, like in maybe more rural areas, where they have trouble getting someone, or hey, I have this great provider, and he's got a great base. We don't want to lose him, so they're willing to pay a little extra, perhaps. Yeah. But in an area such as ours with a dense population, nah. Well, so that's why you need to hire me because I get tips on how to fix that. So, so here's, here's one of the things that I, when I talk to my legal clients and we, we talk about the negotiation, I go through their contracts, I go through all the problems with it. And then, then I list out ways that they can try to get the things they want changed or get, you know, get more money. I mean, that's always on the list. You know, how do I get more money? And, and John Canyon did a podcast on the, on uh, the MP money show way back when and he did a pretty damn good job breaking down how you understand what your value is. And, and I've been doing the same philosophy since then. That's why I think me and John handed off is because we had the same exact philosophies on how we value ourselves. And then once we show the providers that own practices or the, 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 the decision makers that we understand if we make a certain amount of money, then we, we were very valuable. And if we're kicking ass and making them money, and we know it, it's almost like there's a sigh and then they, they kind of like, all right, this guy gets it. All right. You're in the club now. All right. So you kind of get in the club once you, once you let people, you know what you're worth and you don't take those crappy jobs. Let, let those RN pluses have those $85,000 a year jobs because they're not going to last there long. Anyways, they're going to burn them out. And, and eventually those practices are going to say, you know what? I don't want to keep hiring people over and over again. It's a pain in the ass to credential them. It's a pain in the ass to train them. And then they leave anyways as soon as I, I, they realize that I'm not paying them anything. So I think that there's going to be a bottom threshold bar right around the 100 grand mark where any NP, if you, if you go in and, and kick ass and do your job, there's no reason you should be making less than six figures. It's just the way it is. But you have to be able to articulate your value. And if you're seeing eight people a day, you ain't valuable. That's true. I mean, yeah, it's you yeah. got to see the patients, you know, and if you like just seeing eight people a day, then you'd, be, you'd better be happy with your 80 grand. I went to them and said, I know what I generate. Like I, right. either I can tell you the dollar amount that I generate and they're like, okay, yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And then it was kind of like they let you in the club. Yeah. 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 And so, what, and, and if they don't want to let you in the club, I don't want to work there. That, that's, I guess, my point is, you know, if I, I'm a provider, I make money for the practice. I'm not a taker. I'm a maker. And so if I am not making money to, up to my expectation, I fully expect that they're either going to cut my salary or fire me. And that's one of the things I try to tell my students whenever I precept is, you know, you're going from a nurse, which is basically a line item on a budget to right. an income generator. And because of that, it gives you a bigger bargaining chip. Now, the more income you generate, the bigger your chip is. Right. But, you need to realize that you're no longer quote unquote, just a nurse. You're no longer an, a, a line item. You are 
generating and, revenue. And, and that's a good point, Ben, because there's so many nurse practitioners, even with experience, that still still say, "Well, what's the salary? What's the going salary in this in this part of the state?" I hate that question. I really, really do, because they'll they'll point you to salaries.com or look on Indeed for job postings and things like that, and and those are categorically low. I mean, really low. So if you know some basic things, how many patients a day you're going to see, what the typical reimbursement is for per patient, and how many days a week you're going to work, you can calculate what your revenue is pretty darn easily. So it's not really, it's not a lot of rocket science. And so if you can go to the table with that information, that makes it really easy. Now, the people that have a difficult time are those people that are working in the specialties when, you know, surgeons are cutting and you're doing the follow-ups. It doesn't work the same way. So you have to kind of get creative with determining what's your value in those situations. It's typically, you know, how many extra surgeries can you do because I'm here? And how much are those surgeries bringing in that you wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do if I wasn't here? And so it's, you have to get creative to, to see that. How, sometimes value isn't a money item. It's, you know, how much do I take off the plate of the other providers so that their quality of life is better? Which, and for our listeners who may not realize, with a surgery, and, and this may even, I mean, including in, like in the office, if you do an IND or you, you do something like that, there's what's called a global post-op period. And those are not billable visits at that point. So right. any follow-ups during that time frame, so whether it's three days, 30 days, whatever it is, that's... That's covered under that initial billing. And, and that's yeah. typically when the NP gets to see them because that's the physician gets to make the money on those. And, and if it's in, a, if it's in a, a big institution, you know, keep in mind, they want their numbers high. They don't want you taking the numbers, yeah. right? They, they want the billings. And so you get all the post-op stuff that doesn't pay, and they get all the stuff that pays. So it's, sometimes it's institutional issues that, that makes it difficult for us to prove our worth. Tom, do you got anything uh, else before we start rolling into our final segment? If only I knew a civil engineer slash lawyer slash MP <laughs> that I could ask these questions to, I would. <laughs> Next time I need to uh, work on a uh, car and uh, <laughs> now I'm, I'm doing good. I'm just in my head, just thinking about not so much questions like for Jeff per se, but just questions in general, like, God, where are we going? I don't know. The conversation just got a little, deep on a good level for me like oh what are we doing <laughs> like yeah. yeah i wasn't sure where we were going with this i didn't think we were going to go in that direction but no that's the uh, that, take it where it goes i would say yeah this, this show literally uh, no idea like we like you said we press we press the go button and we're like okay let's find out what happens next so which for a guest is sometimes i mean because like, you know i've had several guests send me you know questions and like so what are we gonna talk about or what's I'm like, yeah. well, we're going to have a generalized know. topic of, say, you know, if you're a cardiac NP, we're going to talk about cardiac stuff. But beyond that, it's just where the conversation goes. Yeah. I might ask you, like, what what should I look for or what would you like to see if I refer them to you? Other than that, the next hour, I don't know. Like, it's, it's going to be, <laughs> we're going to go where it goes, man. That's how it, that's how it happens. But a lot of times that's has made for, I mean, obviously it makes for very organic conversations, but I, mean, I think it makes for very good listenable conversations too you know yeah. it's not just that boring monotonous bullshit reading a powerpoint <laughs> that you right. guys and, and conferences and yeah, I, I don't know how many times our guests at the end of the show has been like i never thought i would talk about you know and they would just start i'm like yeah well, that happens you know so so let me let me ask you guys a question and this is kind of a legal issue is that have you do you guys work with a contract do you have a contract at your employer yes okay yes all right. And so uh, have you ever worked in an in a NP position where you did not have a contract? No. Um, yeah, I think I have. Okay. Uh, it, moonlighting jobs. I mean, nothing moonlighting full-time. Side jobs. But, yeah. Okay. And, and that tends to be the case more often than not. So I, I just always ask people if they, you know, in the past, how many jobs have you had and how many times have you had a contract? And, and, and it's almost everybody has a contract. Do you think for some reason that they might want to teach this stuff? Yeah, right. exactly. And honestly, when you first said it, and I thought back to the times me and Ben have spoke about it, it blows my mind that we ill prepare them for that so much because it's every, like almost every one of us, if not every time at some point, we're going to have a contract in front of us. 
And honestly, and, I would say the majority of us don't know what to do with it. And maybe right. we need to uh, revisit contract negotiations, Tom. We, we yeah, can get Jeff back on. and Yeah, maybe maybe we'll have to have a repeat. Hammer hours, yeah. Why don't you, what I would recommend is if you guys have anybody that has questions, you can just have them email them in, and then, and then we'll, we'll hammer out questions. Cool. That sounds That's good. Fun. It's always an invitation. All right. Well, uh, we appreciate that. Let's jump into our final segment. We're going to call oh, it. Oh, this five. is the fun part, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to call it five questions. Let me get the music queued up here. Join us on a journey into the inner psyche of our guest as we ask five, 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 five questions. All right, Jeff. So this is five questions. What this is is we ask the exact same five questions to every single guest that we have. I ask the questions. Tom makes fun of your answers. Are you ready, sir? Yes, yeah, shoot. Let's do this. All right. Question one. I like somebody who's, you know, he's ready to go. He's, yeah, he's oh. he's like, I got stuff to do, Ben. Let's go. I got a refrigerator to build or something. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Question one, Jeff. <laughs> what is your favorite medical word? Oh, uh, smegma. Wow. Ooh, wow. Nice. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> nice. <Yeah>. Don't <laughs> that, go out of smegma jokes, do you, Tom? I, yeah, I, I yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not out there yet. Yeah, nope. That's like the uh, O2 slider. I was like, I was not seeing <laughs> that coming right there. Just, whoa, what what just happened right there? Okay. Uh, how well. do you not laugh when you hear that word? Oh, no, no yeah. That, it, it, everybody yeah. giggle. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's exactly what I did when you first said it. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. Question two, Jeff. If you could do any job in the world other than what you currently do, what would it be? Mm. <laughs> and you uh, can't use any previous jobs. No, <laughs> I, 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 I'm good. I've moved on. I can't go back to. Um, I, you know, I'd love to build motorcycles. I really would. I think it'd be fun as hell. I'm not allowed to ride one or own one, but I could build them. <laughs> you won't let me ride them. Well, first of all, I started laughing because I was thinking the same thing Ben alluded to. I was like, well, what the hell hasn't he already done? Okay, let's right, just yeah, get that out of the like, way. That eliminates a lot of stuff, yeah. So, uh, okay, so hold on. Do you have, like, when you picture a motorcycle, what do you picture in your head? Oh, uh, yeah. Like, what is it? You know, like the American Chopper stuff, like the really just bizarre, stupid, uh, just obnoxiously large yeah like some, some kind of 70s soft tail that's all been yeah, tricked just, out just obnoxious yeah <laughs> but i think it would be i fun. want it to pollute yeah. yeah and be loud it has to be loud yes. rattle well, the windows. look if you're gonna get a bike it's gotta be loud like that's yeah, just no, for sure yeah I, I don't care if it's a cruiser or a crotch right like you that thing just better door rattle that's just how sure. it is agreed all right, Jeff, question three. Think back to your first car. Stylish ride or rolling turd? Oh, no, it was, it was all right. It was in between. I had a 1986 Ford EXP, all right? So <laughs> you've got to understand, I'm, I'm a little older than you guys just by looking at your picture. So, you know, this thing was bitching. I had, it was a stick shift, and it had the emergency brake in the middle, oh, right, yeah. the console. So I, I don't know how many times I slid into the parking lot in high school <laughs> just sideways Ditch the hazard style, and I went through probably three sets of tires on that thing in a year. It was fantastic. Love that car. So I would say stylish ride. I think is. I, I think yeah, we're going to have to make a final determination. Yeah, I think yeah, so. It's an escort, so it's not cool, but it was fun. <laughs> well, that's your first car, it's got to be a little bit of fun. I, mean, I kind of yeah. want that car back. I'm not going to lie to you. I, <laughs> I, I still drive that thing. <laughs> And would you still slide into the parking lot, though? That's the well, question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like a glove. So. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Question four. If your house is on fire, everyone, including your pets, are safe. Other than pictures, what's the one thing you want to get out of your house? Oh, geez. I don't know. I don't, I'm not really attached to anything. I don't know, probably you know, this, this might be politically incorrect, but I got a pretty nice gun collection. I'd probably yeah, grab that. No, that's that's. Uh, but you get one gun. Uh, we've had we've had this debate on the show with other people. So one gun. So I got to pick a gun. One gun. One gun. All right. Let's see which. One it better be good because now you're talking my language. All right. So well, shit. I got a lot of them. I really thought he was going to say slide roll, but. No. <laughs> 
Come on, man. I, I can't say that his brother. Come on. I'm, I'm not that old. I got the TI-86, bro. Uh, so. <laughs> Graphing uh, calculator. All right. I, I, I don't know. I probably got, I've, I've got a pretty cool gun that I got from my dad. It's a uh, World War II British 303 jungle carbine. So it's just a cool old it's that is an, gun yes. that just, I, I think it's neat. Now, I got guns that are way more, more valuable than that, but that's just the coolest because it, it was my dad's and he's had it forever. Are you more of a rifle or a pistol or a shotgun guy? I got them all. No, but I'm saying, like, do you have a preference? Saying, which kid do you like better? Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, Tom. Jeez. Oh. Come on, Tom. No, oh, silly you know, me. I, 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 well, so when I graduated nursing school, my present to myself was I built an AR-15. Nice. So I bought all the parts cheap and, and built it myself, and, and it's it's a fun little gun. But, you know, it's not something that's necessarily the most practical. No, I've uh, bought the lower, but I have not made more progress. I want to, but I just oh, okay. haven't. You got the hardest part to get. <laughs> yeah, yeah right? I got that. But I, it also, it's it's certainly not the most expensive part. So no, it's not. You're right. It's, barrels get expensive. Yeah, I got yeah. to keep barrels too. Yeah, it, right. It, yeah, it starts it starts going up real quick <laughs> from yeah, here. So You start adding on, on cool stuff to it too. Yeah. You can spend a ton of money on that stuff. But So I don't know. I mean, I'm being being sarcastic about my gun collection, but I, I don't know. I just, I'm a hunter, so I, I'm always out in the woods with kids and stuff. So that's, that's just part I, of the culture. I do. I, I'm going to have to go with officially that's a good answer, the Lee Enfield uh, 303. So there, there you go. go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All, All right, right man. Jeff. Question five. You have $9.18 in your pocket. You're at the convenience store. What all are you buying? Oh, geez. Oh, Pete. I don't know. Let's see. I'd probably get, I get usually a large cup of coffee. Okay. Half. You're going to laugh at me. I got, I'm a creeper habit. I do this every day. I get half of the vanilla. What do you call it? Cappuccino. The cappuccino thing. I fill it up because I'm too lazy to do the little cuppy thing. The vanilla <laughs> creamer. Yeah. Half of that, half a coffee. And, and uh, let's see, what does that leave me? About six bucks left, right? Seven bucks left. Yeah. There you go. Uh, a day. bag of hot fries. Those things are awesome. Yeah. And I don't know. Tall boy beer. Probably. Wow. <laughs> For the drive home? What's going, what's going on there, sir? Well, you got to go up. You got to come down, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I was going to ask, but right as you said coffee, I'm like, okay, how, are we, how do we take our coffee? I, I really need to try, though, as a very popular option, the like half of flavored and like half black. I still haven't done. It. I've been always been one cream, one sweet and low. So See, it's, just, it's too much time to little cups, and I got fat thumbs, and it's just not worth it. I just hit the button, and it's done. And it, over the years, it's gotten more and more of the foo foo stuff in there than probably it was in the past. You know, because it was like I can't admit that I'm getting this French vanilla. Right. Right. You, know, yeah. hey, you know what? When people say that stuff. I, I don't do the one cream and one sweet low because I'm like old school. I just do it because that's like what I know. What yeah, people right. say, what people say the whole, well, that's like a vanilla. So I don't even, I'll make up some word, but vanilla latte. I'm like, yeah, Hey, if it tastes good, good, I'm drinking it. I don't yeah, care right. about your opinion. So <laughs> there you go. So Jeff, what's your beer of choice? Oh, geez. I don't discriminate. No, no I, I, so I have a buddy that um, worked with me at one of my engineering, my last engineering company is a, an electrical instrumentation control engineer. And um, I kind of lost touch with him and then we reconnected. He actually is the brew guy. He's like the engineer for Great Lakes Brewing. Oh. And so, you know, I kind of, I kind of, it's expensive and it's good, but, you know, I, I kind of support Great Lakes. Well, now the next time I go out and get a beer, I guess I'll be buying some Great Lakes. Just to be like, hey, I know a guy who knows a guy. Hey, would, Tom, would you come up this way? You want to head up to Cleveland? I can get us in. We'll go for a backstage uh, tour if you want. So Done. <laughs> Done. I did a podcast uh, driving up to go and do that with another guy that I met on the internet. We bullshit and... And uh, we met up there and met my buddy, and he took us back. We saw the tanks. It was, it was neat. It was really cool. Well, if I can ever get Ben to come visit me again. I'll work yeah, on where, it. Where yeah. are you, Ben? Ben, where are you located at? Kansas. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got him to come up here one time, Jeff, and I got him to go to the world-famous Columbus Zoo. 
You and know? then we got held hostage by a bear really? for a day. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now Ben will never come back to Ohio, <laughs> and he hates Ohio. Jack Hanna. So, <laughs> it's a that's a whole other story for off the air, but it is entertaining. <laughs> it's funny uh, now. I'll tell you right it, now it that day now. he was not laughing. <laughs> so. When yeah, you get held, know. when you get held hostage by a bear in a building for several hours at the Columbus Zoo, apparently you get really cranky. So, yeah. it uh, it was a funny thing, though. <laughs> oh well, on that note, that concludes five questions and apparently some back history into Tom and I. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> I'll let your editing wizardry come in handy later. I guess yeah, we'll so. see what happens. You might make more of the cuts than you think. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all at Just Some Podcast. You can find us on the web or at www.justsomepodcast.com. Our emails admin at justsomepodcast.com. If you do want us to do another contract negotiation show with and bring Jeff back, we can you know, email some questions there, admin at justsomepodcast.com, and we will uh, rapid fire those to him and see what we can do. Jeff, uh, tell them where they can find you at, man. You guys can find me on Facebook at the NP Dude. Uh, and on uh, the interwebs, thenpdude.com. We look forward to your show coming back as soon as you get your house built, man. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on tonight. It was great. It's been a great time uh, learning all about Jeff the NP Dude and kind of the, uh, you know, one of the beginnings of podcasting for nurse practitioners. And anyway, man, on that note, I uh, hope everybody has a great week. Hey, everybody, stay safe out there. Swearing just to pass the time Lately I see why I am alone I caught some road bridge and I thought of you